he is basically a mechanical engineer and mtech in thermal engineering from coop and immediately after that he joined forbes martial r and d and basically he his work basically on the combustions and heat transfer and gas dynamics uh, so he has three patents and he has written more than 20 uh, papers in journals and conferences he has awarded young and emerging leader in energy efficiency uh, in 2020 wow, at by cii okay. national level he also won the national award for the development for the most energy efficient you know you know to product award twice in 2012 and 2020 so he has very uh, hands on experience in burners and boilers and um, and is is working his domain knowledge so how to improve the energy efficiency and he he is doing doing lot of work in software development uh, the building the use cases in the in the in in the area of combustion so currently he is a you know lead in innovation management of forbes marshall so i will not wait, I take more time let's uh, take it over to the sripad now thank you okay so am i audible okay yes you are about to yeah okay so let me share my screen and please let me know when you will be able to see this yeah yes we can see it you can see it right okay uh, so thanks a lot vinod for all of those kind words and we know this is a good friend so i expect those kind words from him anyway <laughs> so thank you thanks on that note uh, as we know said um, i i am i am shripad kulkarni uh, i currently work with pose marshall and i am with pose marshall r&d from last 15 years and today i will just touch upon few of the case studies uh, for optimizing energy efficiency which we have worked through the process automation and data analytics part uh so expect them to be more from the domain where i'm comfortable with uh, the domain where i have worked with uh so just from that perspective just a very quick couple of slides uh, on pose marshall uh pose marshall is a pune based multinational company uh, it's a proud heritage 70 plus years old company uh five manufacturing facilities uh, worldwide one of them is at uk bakewell uh r and d engineers are the strength for pose marshall more than 90 engineers and they come from all the disciplines like mechanical electrical electronics software it from all the background and a very strong customer connect is what the usp for pose marshall uh what we do uh, basically we are one stop solution for steam engineering and control instrumentation product uh when i say steam engineering it's steam generation like boilers steam distribution and utilization like trap and other accessories and then the condensate recovery part of it and then the control instrumentation where all the parts of instruments meters gauges dcs all that we manufacture and we have a strong presence into them uh and whom we serve is basically all of these process industries uh where the requirement would be from the steam or from the control instrumentation practically from the utility and the process side as we call it as uh idea of uh, telling this to you because expect all the examples and the cases which i will be covering uh, is more from this domain uh and that's why just a very brief introduction about what we do what uh, we are trying to do in a way okay so let's jump into the topic now uh so let's look at the market first because ultimately we develop the product for the market so if you see uh, when i am saying that i joined r&d 15 years before uh, at that point of a time the needs were or the way the product development used to happen is that a mechanical team will develop its part into the product they will hand it over or the electronics and instrumentation team will do their part and then they will be merged together and idea and expectation from the customer side is basically that the product should function and it should deliver for the function for what uh, it is designed for today the situation is dramatically different today not only customer expects from you that uh, the product uh, to be functioning and it should be doing its job but along with that they expect the data to be logged the data to be available at their doorstep 
uh, not only product should tell that whether it's performing to its fullest efficiency, it should also tell whether it's why it is not performing to fullest efficiency. It should also tell that uh, what the maintenance part may be coming into the picture and preferably if it can do by itself, that's the bonus. So a very drastically and dramatically different product development need today. And that's why uh, the mandate could be very clearly for all of us is every product needs to be data compatible. And that's where we should be going upon. But when we say that every product should be data compatible and we should be looking into it, we should be going into the market. Uh, at the same time, we need to understand uh, that it should have some business value for that proposition. And customers will be at a different maturity level uh, for which they will be looking at it, these solutions from various angles. So uh, when we uh, kind of and saw through it, we uh, not only we, but overall, the context is that we can categorize customers into four types depending upon their maturity level for the acceptance for this kind of end solutions. And when I say this solution, this is basically you can term it as IIoT, you can say them process automation plus data analytics at advanced level put together. But basically a complete through and through optimization solution is what I'm talking about. Uh, so the first category of customers could be the observers. Uh, these are the people who understand things well, who understand the power of online monitoring, uh, but they are still analyze the business potential through it. They are not in a hurry, they are playing for the waiting game. They are waiting for some kind of end stabilization into the domain. The another category is for followers who have sensor based installed, but they are ready only for the proven system that they will probably ask you for some kind of an referencing or they themselves need to be very convinced that this will 100% work and then then only they will go for the uh, installation or further part of it. The third category is riders where they are actually having the sensor base installed, they are monitoring, they are logging the data, uh, they have the database, but they are not effectively utilized in a way for the optimization of the process or optimization of the utilities. So there is no benchmarking with them. And the last part is probably the most advanced customers, uh, we call them as a racing team, who have all the IoT network in installed, they have the production utility, they have the intelligent, dynamic, uh, intelligent analysis going through, and what they will be eyeing for is that comparative matrix between their own plants or between the competitor plant where they want to set the benchmark for their own production. Now, uh, the point is whom to address. Uh, shall we select or shall we uh, go for all of them? Yes, we should be going for all of them because at any point of a time, you will find such category of customers, maybe at a different maturity level, maybe a different quadrant but all the customer will be not at the same pace. So we should be catering for all of them. And now if you want to categorize all of them, we should also have a framework and that framework should suffice all of that. So how, what framework can we devise? The first one, which I'm talking about is the, if you can see at the bottom of corner is maintain. When I say maintain is basically maintaining the current state of the equipment, whether it is from the energy side or whether it is from the uptime side. So basically we are preserving the current condition, but we are preserving that current condition with the help of technology. And that in simple word, if I have to say, it's the pure monitoring systems, but that monitoring of what to monitor and what is important to the customer is what the intellect we need to build. The second point is the respond. When I say respond, it is again for preserving the current situation, but with the help of people. So we will basically augment the monitoring part and we'll give the inputs to the operator, inputs to the people who are concerned for that machine so that they can take the corrective action and ultimately preserve the current condition. So they will basically categorize the followers type of customer as we are, dis uh, as we are discussing a minute before. The third category is improve. So what this will do is this is now taking them to the next level. And that is basically excelling into what they are doing. But this is with the help of people. So a fully automated system, uh, which is kind of an uh, optimized to an extent, but with the help of people is what, be, what will be categorized into this. And this will, uh, this will answer all the needs that riders people have, as I was explaining earlier. And the last part to which innovate, a fully automated system with less or very minimal minuscule manual intervention. And this will be for the people who are into the racing team category, who wanted to be benchmark, who wanted to be world-class into that domain. 
Now, in next few minutes, what I will do is basically I will cover examples of each of these quadrant and will try to show you that how we have addressed rather than I would say we, it's rather than the need of the customers, how it can be addressed. And uh, these are coming from a particular domain, but applicable for all the domains which, which can be seen through the similar kind of an perspective. So if we see maintain, and as I was saying that just, just monitor the data, give the insights to the customer. Many a times the people who are looking at the data may not be knowing that what's coming along their way. So, so, so some of the very few examples I will cover. Uh, since I will be covering few examples from the boiler side, I will just put down a very a minute to explain the, what the boiler is. Basically, boiler is used to convert water into steam with the help of fuel. And that fuel could be uh, gaseous fuel, liquid fuel, solid fuel. And for that, you need combustion air for, for that case in a way. So how we can say that, that if that air is required, the air circuit comes into the picture. Since I have, we are burning fuel, fuel circuit comes into the picture. Uh, since we have to give water for the steam generation, water circuit comes into the picture. And for all the instrumentation, for the pumps to operate, etc., etc., electrical circuit comes into the picture. So this is very brief about the boiler. So let's look at the first example. Uh, so this is the simplest example. We just monitored the power coming into the boiler. And the reason was the customer were complaining uh, that a particular component is, failu uh, is failing consistently. And uh, when it is being inquired, when it is being discussed, the point was there are no power fluctuations are coming. Now just to look at the data, and if you see from that perspective, you can see that there are power fluctuations coming in. And because this is the maximum installed base electrical power consumption. And if you see in a day, there are more than 10 times the fluctuations were happening. Now there is no advanced analytics built into this. There is not much of the data, AI, ML at this point, no. This is the very simplistic monitoring, but it is giving you the insight that what is happening. And this is kind of a thing that I, as I was saying many times, customer will not be aware of too. So this is insight to them. Looking at a second example, uh, when you feed the water into the boiler for converting into steam, you have two pumps and both of the pumps uh, are supposed to work uh, on a shift basis. So they can be shipped into an ATAR, they will be shipped into a DAV, uh, and one another pump will be operating. Ideally, both of them should work in the same way. But if they don't, then there is something wrong with a pump. What is wrong with a pump? We will go with the advanced analytics. But only monitoring the pressure part of it, pressure of the boiler and the pump on off, we can tell that one pump is not uh, the exact with the similar, the second pump is operating and you should be paying more, more attention to the one pump. The third example could be uh, when you have uh, the boiler on, when the, you are passing up the fuel. So what happens is that uh, you first start the air, the air will pass through, then you inject the fuel, the combustion will happen. And when you have to stop it, you have to stop the fuel first and after some time the air will be stopped. So this is called as pre-purging of air and post-purging of air. Now, many a times when the boiler goes for the maintenance, the operator will train, uh, will may not set this limit to the same extent of seconds. So as I was showing up here, this could be 15 second cycle and this could be 30 second cycle. Now for listening, it seems very small, but if your number of on-off cycle for the boilers are very high, the losses are substantial. And very such kind of end things, the operator will not be able to understand if not monitored because 15 seconds is such a small amount of time. But if you monitor then you can very quickly go through, you can quickly correct and save those losses. Uh, the last example is about the blowdown. So what happens when you use the water, same water for generating steam, the, the, the salts in the water starts accumulating and then you have to pass it on. That's called a blowdown for the boiler. Uh, now, the operators will vary shift wise and then there could be shift wise variation into the number of blowdowns too. So an operator will give two blowdown, an operator will give three blowdown, there could be a difference into the timing for that. And that difference in timing is actually energy loss to you. Because uh, as you are giving the water out, it's basically heated, all the energy is already passed to it and then you are discharging it through the blowdown. Uh, that's, that's, that's a loss, that's a straight loss. And so that you need to optimize that. But before optimizing, you need to know that this is what is happening. And that's why uh, you need to track this. So this kind of hand tracking will show you that why it is happening. 
another example as i was talking about blow down watch is the blow down wall working so what can happen is that if your blow down wall is perfectly fine your temperature will drop down to the atmospheric temperature very quickly there could be a certain time for that but if it is leaking then there would be decay in temperature but not at the rate what we want it and this if you don't have monitored probably this could continue for a long time and since you are losing the water of course again very straight energy loss so these are the very simple examples from the maintenance side that there is no analytics built in there is no formulation built in these are just the monitoring part of it if you monitor well if you look at well you can conclude by yourself let's move on to the second part of it where we called as respond where now we are giving operator the inputs that what you should be doing for optimizing your process and in this case i would cover uh, an example from an brewery industry so uh, in in industry currently the traditional practice is that uh, the current steam consumptions and the production however the production is part is being monitored with a uh, with a term called as specific steam consumption which is basically a strict ratio of how much is steam being uh, consumed for a 24 hours and how much of the production is being generated into that so this just talks about that how much of the steam utilized per kg of product produced or per meter of cloth being processed etc Uh, but it doesn't talk about the actual effective utilization of the steam because this talks about a steam which is actual steam plus the steam wastage and where we actually started at a process level to talk about the actual steam utilization and then we come up with a factor uh, which is steam energy factor now what does this talk about is a steam energy factor is basically a ratio of actual steam consumed to the thermodynamic calculated or limit of steam that process should have utilized so this straight away tells us that how much extra steam being consumed for that particular operation and uh, it good is it bad and if it is bad where you can correct it so if you look it from that perspective let's take a very simple example of evaporation process now when we study evaporation in academics it comes simply as you have some fluid you want to evaporate it or you want to raise the temperature and for doing that you just need an higher temperature fluid like steam in this case and it will get condensed that's how the simple the process looks but when it comes to an industrial domain what happens is this this becomes a bit complicated and complicated in a way uh, you are providing steam so the parameters like steam pressure steam temperature comes into the picture uh, since the condensate is getting uh, condensed at the end of it whether the traps and other accessories are functioning those parameters come into the picture then there are various parameters from the fluid side comes like specific gravity composition the chemicals used etc etc and most probably there will be an heat recovery system so for heat recovery system also there are certain parameters now this all put together makes process complicated from the optimization point of view because now you start to realizing that it's becoming difficult that which parameter is affecting what and whether i should be correcting something in which direction so that my overall energy consumption goes down so what we did basically was uh, we put down together all the parameters which are affecting uh, the process i won't go into these details but basically all the aspects like i was talking about steam aspect what are the parameters condensate aspect what are the parameters on the process aspect what are the parameters we put down the list of all of those parameter and we sensorized it and what we did was basically we calculated based on all of these parameter we put down a statistical model which is multivariate regression model as you can see it up here where the assumption was the steam being utilized only for drying or evaporation because there is no third function of steam being available and then from the inlet side and outlet side either of these parameter if we map we are good enough to go because then we know that how much is the change of state has happened for that particular process now when we put together and we run the model into that we gets the scf which i was talking about when we get the steam energy factor we actually know that how much of steam is currently consumed and ideally how much it should have consumed and it also shows us the parameter which are affecting the steam energy factor now what does this is showing is that if this is negative which you can see up here this particular factor is actually inversely proportional to the steam consumption so if reduced the steam consumption will increase that's how you can see now 
the actual values whether negative or positive if you work on these to reduce your actual steam con consumption will reduce so now the job for the operator is becoming easier that he has to get this graph see which parameter has the maximum value work on it and reduce it to more closer to zero so that what happens he will get after this being reduced to the extent possible he will move on to the next parameter and that potential is actually ensuring that you are reducing the amount of energy consumed so just for an example i want to show that if we have map ssc which is specific steam consumption look at these two batches here it is 10.27 here it is 11 so from ssc side if you see still this is less you will say this is a better batch but on SCF side, if you see, this is 1.59 and this is 1.55. So this bat is actually more energy efficient. Now this is where it becomes critical that what you are mapping and where you are relating to. So in this case, when we actually completed this exercise, the customer was actually getting around 15 to 70% of the energy saving on the steam part. Now this is a generic process. So I have taken the example of evaporation, but for any heating process, any evaporation process, this can be applied across all the process industries. That's how the kind of a second quadrant for or could be worked, or this could be an offering for the second quadrant where we are talking about the followers to be taken care of. Then we come to the third. Then we come to the third part where we are talking are talking about the excelling. When we are talking about excelling, I am talking about the riders where we are going to give a very optimized control system. Uh, for here, just to show you that MAC is basically measurement, analysis and control. And then there could be multiple applications coming from all the process industries where the similar kind of an functionality or philosophy can be extended to. Here also I will cover one example so that it becomes clearer for you that what exactly I am talking about. Uh, but before that, for the desolotizing toaster, I have just a small back uh, kind of an explanation is that basically you have seeds and from that you convert the edible oil, for example, ground nuts, for example, sunflower seeds, and you become the, uh, you convert them to the edible oil. Such an industry is called as solvent extraction plant. And in solvent extraction plant, one of the devices is desolventizing toaster, where what happens is that when you crush the seeds, the seeds, the hexane, which is basically the chemical used for extracting the oil, the inheritance moisture into the seed and some fraction of oil is basically comes to this device, which is desolventizing toaster. And job of desolventizing toaster is basically to remove all the hexane, which is very costly. It costs almost equivalent to diesel. That hexane need to be recovered completely. And not only hexane to be removed completely, the crushed seeds which, which comes out of the, this device is basically used as animal feed. And if it is soya seed, it can also be used as human proteins. So it also has a commercial value. So the objective for the customer is not only to have this hexane recovered completely, but also to have the quality and consistency of the uh, de-oiled cake as it called as coming out of this. And uh, this is just a photograph to give you the kind of an indication that how big would be a desolvantizing toaster looks like. So what happens is basically you fill up the crushed seeds plus hexane plus moisture plus oil into this. This will have steam coming indirectly or directly and you have the temperatures. So the first level of automation, the first level of control would be manual where these temperature set points or this control wall will be set manually so that that meal is getting heated, the hexane is getting separated and all the DOC is coming out with a specific moisture and day oil cake temperature. Now, uh, is that the most optimized method? No, but that could be the first level where the operator operates. And if you see up here, this is what the manual operation that where we get a DOC, DOC when I'm said DOC, this is the outlet of meal at a certain temperature and specific amount of steam is being consumed for that. Now let's come to the second level of kind of an optimization where what you can do is basically give up the set points to all these compartments, put up the control walls and then control wall will operate with respect to the set point. Will that better of the situation? Yes, surely it will better of the situation. Uh, but then there could be variations like uh, the operator might might uh, might not be able to know that what exactly the ideal set points for that particular meal or with that particular input. 
there could be shift change and then the uh, the meal which is coming in will change the amount of chemical like hexane moisture will vary for the same flow rate and the last part could be in many a times the customers will operate on one particular soya for a day and then he will change to groundnuts for another day and then in that case if the customer if the operator doesn't change the set point then also an energy loss but is this the better situation than the manual operation yes so when we did that it has actually come, came down substantially on both the grounds so doc also come to a right temperature and the steam consumption also reduced by the 45 kgs 40 kgs per kg uh, but that's still not the most optimized case and that's why we use the example or we use the advanced data analytic techniques into this so what we did basically was we use the machine learning algorithm for these inputs where we monitor the temperature of each compartment we monitor the temperature at the outlet of hz we monitor the temperature of the doc and the other parameters like moisture etc we monitor few other parameters all put together we put up an algorithm which says that if the temperature of the first compartment doesn't changes by certain amount of time by certain time then it should correct its set point then what has happened now and i have just given an example of one compartment it is for all compartment with a complex algorithm but what it has done basically then is that now this desolonizing toaster has become completely self set point based methodology so now you do not have to manually intervene it so whatever the inputs coming in whatever the chemical propositions coming in you are changing the feed you are changing the input flow rates you are changing the other parameters and even if you don't know what the other parameters are changing still the system is capable of setting its own set points uh, did we get any benefit yes so now you can see that it has come to the actual optimal level of doc temperature as well as substantial reduction even at an auto operation the below graph is just showing you that how closely doc is operating at the required temperature uh, this is just an example that how closely those parameters are being coming along what do i mean to say is that uh, even for an very optimized system uh, currently operate currently in operation at any level based on these advanced techniques uh, so this is one example for the desolvent engine toaster these are just uh, just a few screens which i put just to show so look at the control was 100 percent open now they have started reduce uh, even if you can see that the set points were 73 they are coming down so all of these just to show that how it works so that's how that's for one industry uh, is it replicable for all the process yes just to add one into that is there is vertical drying range which is used to, uh, uh, so if this is used in the textile industry so you have cloths which you dye for different colors and then the next step required is to dry it so for drying it you use vertical drying cylinders and in those cylinders steam goes in uh, the cloth goes around it and the cloth gets dried that's how the simple process is uh, but is it difficult for optimizing that process as a whole very difficult why because look at the variables coming into picture what is the type of fabric so type of fabric could be polyester it could be cotton it could be terry towel one day and these are varying into that part so your set points will vary the pressure and temperature of the steam has to vary depending upon the fabric the number of drying cylinders you want to use the kind of an uh, the peripheral arrangements for those cylinders will vary the speed for all of those cylinders and glm or the cloth will will also or can also vary the trap configuration i would don't go into detail of this but this can also vary and then the inlet and outlet moistures for all of them has vary so uh, is it simple to do all of this kind of an optimization with traditional system it's a bit difficult so again you have to use the similar kind of a methodology which i explained to you just before and which have which we have used for the desolentizing toaster uh, using the same kind of a methodology, similar kind of a mapping, similar kind of a set points and auto set point system, we, have, we can also optimize the vertical drying range and all the other process equipment into the process industry. So these are the typical third kind of an offering which I was talking about. This is the way, this is where that now we have started moving towards the benchmarking. We have taught starting towards the automation of the system uh, intellectually on that part. 
Now let me come to the last quadrant for that. This is for the racing team and where we have to cover that all the aspect, uh, preferably completely uh, manless or preferably from the point of view that it, the system itself is taking care for itself. Uh, so till now we saw descriptive analysis that what has happened predictive analysis which we saw in certain cases but this will be the major part of this that what could happen and how we can avoid that and then the prescriptive analysis that what should one do for the desired outcome which practically means the benchmarking part of this so all this need to be tied together into the quadrant where we should give uh, this should be the full fledged system which is uh, which is delivering the purpose of energy optimization to the fullest extent so on that line, if I just have to give you one example where uh, you how detailed you have to go into the similar line or how how your need finding need to be very strong, just look at this graph. So this graph, don't look at the, the blue and red lines for the timing, just look at the dotted lines. What does it say is that when the boiler operators who has to map the data on the logbook. Okay, so let me uh, talk about that first. That even though you have a monitoring system, we need to have the logbook maintained based on the IBR guidelines. For IBR guidelines, it is to be maintained. You need to go to all the equipments into the boiler where there are pressure gauges or, uh, or some kind of a display or labels being there. You have to monitor it for each hour and you have to put it into the logbook. It is a very tedious activity for the boiler operator because all of these equipments will be at a different place. He has to go there, he has to look at it. Uh, many a times he has to remember the value, come back to his place, put down into the paper or into the register. And that's why if you see, when we map the boiler operator completely, basically he didn't have a good uh, emotions when he's putting up these values at the uh, values into the logbook. And so can we do something for that? is what the point is and that's how we started idea of showing is that it needs a very firm kind of an partnership with the end customers where you want to team them up so that a very uh, high profile system can be delivered now just to cover two quick examples from that is look at the oil heaters now in oil heaters firstly i told you about the whether the device is working not working on that part now we are coming to a higher level where we not only covering that, that how is the current performance, what is happening to it, is it running to fullest efficiency. Now we are going to the next level and telling that what is going to happen in future or when the maintenance is due, at what point of a time you will start losing substantial heat so that you should be uh, maintaining the uh, your own devices. So again, uh, based on the accurate actual value and predicted model, you can tell them that when something is going to fail and before that they have to act. Uh, same is the case with the blowdown wall. Since a bit, bit technical, I'm not getting into this, that how we have arrived to this. Uh, okay, so still I will cover one example into that line. So for oil heaters, we map the temperature rise required for each day when we are initially starting it. And looking at it, we started mapping that how much extra time it is taking on a daily basis. It will be minuscule to start with, but since we are mapping it continuously, you will start to seeing a trend after a few days. And that will actually, if you extrapolate, then you will come to a point that at a critical point where, where and when it will reach. And at that point, ideally, it's a system failure for you. So you need to be very aware on that part that, that you shouldn't be reaching there and then there could be a critical point where you can warn them, etc, etc on that slide. Uh, how much time do I have? Yeah, 10 minutes. Uh, 10 minutes. Say 5 minutes and 10 yeah. minutes for uh, your answers. Okay. Five minutes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thanks. Uh, so ultimately, what should it deliver to the customer is the efficiency as we are talking about. And on that part, it will be directly giving them this kind of a matrix. What does it say? It says that what is the current value of S to F, where S to F stands for steam to fuel ratio, which is practically a measurement of a direct steam efficiency, that how much it is currently. Then you can talk about what is the best value of S to F you have reached on the same or similar operating parameters up till now. So this could, be, could have been the addition into this and ideally what's being committed. Now, by this, 
at the side of this it will show you all the kind of an parameters which is basically affecting you that all these parameters are why they are not getting maintained and then you can start correcting one by one and ideally you do not have to correct them one by one the system will itself will start correcting one by one but there are certain parameters in boiler where you have to do it manually but bearing those rest all of them will be taken care by the system uh, a very custom made report as i was saying ki since it required a very good partnership with the with uh, with the solution provider and uh, ex, uh, and the end customer it has to come from that side uh, once you have all the data once you have done all the analytics of course the rest of the report making could be uh, any way any way that's happening so i won't again go into that of details so these are the examples these are the cases we i which i want to cover very briefly but having said that having talked about all of these examples and this it's very difficult to predict that on which way the technologies will go so on that note on a very lighter note i am sharing one example where in 1980s at&t commission mckenzie to know that how will be the cell, cell phone uses will go into us into by 2020 uh the mckenzie group argued they worked on it and they come up with a thought process that it will always be a niche market and they forecasted that by that time it will be 0.9 million subscribers uh do you know or if you know how off they were so they were less than 1% of the actual figure figure so us has reached by that time is 109 million and then at&t has spent a lot of money to get into the market and create the space for themselves bottom line is very clear is that predicting any technology outburst is very difficult what we can do is best is that look at the current business value proposition look at where the current confidence level is and on some amount of risk we should be uh, it's easy basically that we are on uh, easiness on your part that you will be more comfortable within dealing such situations so that's it from my side and hope i have finished in time so yes yeah. okay. thank you sripa thank you so by your presentation we understood that whatever the benchmarking we do it's not enough and with the help of technology we have to improve improve and to so whatever the level we have so we have to improve on our energy efficiency so Correct. i request all the all the members who joined this webinar to ask your questions or you can put it on the chat box so that we can have the small session of 10 minutes for for question and answer i'm sure people will be having questions because there are many things which are not answered in in this small time so the uh, in so members can start entering in the uh, chat box hey shripad uh, rahul agarwal here uh thank first of all thank you for the great presentation uh i my actually question was mayer from the uh from the from the business model perspective so this comes as a service for force marshal or it is kind of packaged into the product uh so typically i would say the enovite and the excel piece yeah so thanks rahul for that question uh it's actually both means to be very honest uh, with you as you are rightly mentioning it uh it comes from the perspective that ideally it should be delivering first and that could be uh, termed as package but at the same time post marshal takes uh, uh, you know kind of an ownership for that that it, it uh, should not be delivered at one time but it should be very sustainedly delivered and from that point of view uh, it actually case to case basis but uh, potentially i would say it's both it's uh, sometimes it's product sometimes it's service sometimes it's product plus service but we prefer it to be product plus service the reason being then uh, uh, we are at a more control from the point of view what we being committed to the customer 